Good morning, everyone. Uh, I see lots of people still signing on. Uh, but we're going to get started as we only have an hour today uh, for this uh, caucus Re Student Affairs Research Month webinar. My name is Amy Gockel. I'm the Assistant Dean Student at the Lausanne School of Engineering at York University. I'm happy to be your host today uh, as a member of the Caucus Professional Development Committee. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our webinar today. But before we begin, I just have a couple of housekeeping items to let you all know about. First off, uh, all of the phone lines have been muted, so uh, there should be no background noise, um, and there should be no reason other than for the webinar um, facilitators and our and our speakers to actually um, be speaking on the phone. So uh, we will only be taking questions through the chat box today, which is located in the lower left hand of your screen. Uh, so feel free to uh, post questions there. Uh, our, our, um, our two speakers will do their best to answer those questions. We are going to allow specific time at the end of the question, at the, towards the end of um, today's hour to allow some uh, time for questions as well. I do want to let all of you know that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, as a member benefit, this webinar will be posted on the caucus website at a later date. So please do be aware uh, that, the, that it is being recorded. If you have any technical issues today uh, that you need assistance with, please feel free to use the chat box again at the lower left hand uh, corner of your, of your screen. To, uh, and you can direct those questions directly to the chairperson, uh, and they'll be happy to work with you to help resolve any technical questions. Um, and that's all of the housekeeping. So without further ado, so we can get uh, started and, and learn a lot, I'm happy to present uh, the predictive modeling for students at risk of leaving college and the intrusive model interventions at Mohawk College being presented by Tim Fricker and Megan Pratt. And I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves as they are the experts on themselves. So Tim and Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy. I'm uh, assuming everybody can hear me, so I'm just going to make sure that's a yes. Amy, can you just verify that I can be heard? By everybody okay? Perfect. Uh, Jill, yeah. Rhonda, thank you for your quick uh, uh, messages there because uh, I didn't want to start talking without uh, ensuring people could hear me. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us uh, for this webinar. I really just want to express my gratitude to Caucus for organizing this, Amy for being our host, um, and the, the folks at Managing Matters that are uh, supporting this. Uh, I also want to uh, um, say that we're excited to present um, on some of this work that we're doing. So uh, Megan and I are from Mohawk College. For those of you that are uh, not familiar with Mohawk, uh, we're your pretty typical comprehensive community college. We'd be considered one of the large colleges in Ontario. We have 13,000 full-time students on uh, three campuses, one that's uh, a collaborative campus with McMaster, one that's our skilled trades campus in Stony Creek, but Megan and I spend most of our time um, at the Hamilton Mountain campus, known as the Fennel campus, where most of this research was taking place. So real quick uh, about me, um, I, uh, prior to my time at, at Mohawk, I, I spent uh, my career in uh, student housing and residence life. Um, and I've just recently started a, a PhD in the Community College Leadership Program at OIZ, uh, which is the University of Toronto. And my portfolio at Mohawk includes student success advising um, and a whole bunch of student success uh, and retention initiatives. And so this research is one example of that. I'm going to turn it over to Megan real quick to introduce herself. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. Can I just ensure that everyone can also hear me as well? We can. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so happy Friday, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Megan Pratt, and I am the supervisor of the Student Success Research Project Portfolio at Mohawk. 
Uh, I'm an OCT certified teacher, and I recently completed my Master's of Education in Administration and Leadership from Brock University. Uh, while completing my Master's in 2013, I began working at Mohawk where I had the opportunity to implement our Supplemental Instruction Program and get involved in the design and delivery of some student leadership programming on campus. Um, in my current role, which began last summer, my portfolio includes a few different research projects which are all basically related to the first year experience, uh, spanning orientation programs, targeted outreach campaigns, and the pre-entry advising project that we'll be chatting about today. Thanks, Megan. Um, so there's also a whole bunch of people that are actually a part of this research, which I think uh, we'll talk about a little bit more, but I would say this is a really unique uh, collaboration between Mohawk, between Dr. Ross Finney, um, who's the a professor at the University of Ottawa, but also the director of the Educational Policy Research Initiative, known as EPRI, uh, and uh, HECO, who we have great appreciation for and gratitude for, for their funding uh, and support of this research through the Access and Retention um, Consortium. So I can speak uh, a little bit about that uh, in more detail later. Um, but Wayne Poirier is, uh, is certainly uh, a really, really supportive Vice President and leader, and without his support, none of this would happen. And certainly without the, the academic and, and analytical expertise and the, uh, the innovative approaches of EPRI and Dr. Ross Finney, this wouldn't happen either. So um, lots of people involved on the research team, including probably half a dozen people at EPRI that are involved. So the purpose of this presentation today um, is um, to go over the research project. The research project we're talking about has two major parts. One is to evaluate new approaches to academic advising as a student success intervention uh, before students' first semester in college, and also to evaluate our predictive model for classifying and supporting students at risk of leaving college early. We're not going to talk a whole lot about the predictive model piece today. Really what we're going to talk about is the implementation of that number one above, that part of the research that is the academic advising uh, before first semester. So we'll give you a little bit of context. We'll talk about this unique research partnership. Megan will go into detail about the implementation, and we'll talk a little bit about some lessons learned, and then have some time for questions at the end. So into the, uh, and the part that we also won't talk about too, too much, is we're not going to go much into uh, too much theory, and we're not going to go too much into the analytics of what we're doing. Really, this is just to talk about, for those that haven't done research before, kind of what it takes to put something like this on. So um, some foundation. In 2012, around the time I started, our president then, Rob McIsaac, put out a call to action to uh, Mohawk College to dramatically improve um, retention and graduation rates on campus. That launched the planning of a, a three-year student success plan, uh, which includes um, addressing the key drivers of student success, um, creating an institutional commitment across academic, corporate, and student services, uh, building it on um, some student services models that uh, have proven to be quite good, um, and keeping um, on top of all of these things through constant monitoring, research, and evaluation. So that's sort of the foundation of what we do. This student lifecycle advising model that you see in front of you is before my time, but it is, you know, many of you may have something very similar to this at your institution about, you know, prospective students choosing the right program for them. Once they've um, selected their program, confirmed their application to the college or university of their choice, through transition and orientation programming, helping them prepare uh, to come to campus for their first year. And then once they're here, helping them succeed through advising and services and support programs. That's the basis of what we do. The part that we think is unique is once they've confirmed, especially at a community college, um, students come in and do um, assessments. So they'll do a math assessment, they'll do a communications assessment, and they do something called a student entrance survey. That, we gather tons of data about these students um, before they even get here on day one. And so our approach is to try and take all of 
that information and model it out into some buckets and say, well, these students are really, they're college ready. Here's some people that need a little bit of help. They're underprepared. And here's people that we think that are academically at risk. And sometimes they're placed into developmental or remedial courses um, assigned to a specific advisor that can help them out. And so that's what we've envisioned, but we haven't really got into that too much. And so part of this research project is to take that concept and see if it makes any sense to layer it over top of Ross Finney's predictive model and see if we can really do something meaningful there. So that's sort of the foundation of what we do. When it comes to advising and really any front-facing student roles, we've used um, there's this great piece of literature by Kuhn, Gordon, and Weber that you see in front of you. I encourage you to read it if you're an advisor or an advising administrator. Um, that really talks about kind of a hierarchy of advising from really basic informational work that um, frontline staff can do to developmental advising to the sort of regulated work of, of counseling. Our student success advisors, which are our academic advisors, really focus on anything from informational through developmental. Um, and this sort of model has helped us create some clarity on campus about who does what, who advises what, um, and keeps things nice and clean. So our student success advisors um, use a few approaches. So first of all, we really believe in an intrusive advising approach. It's more commonly referred to as proactive advising. It's about that intentional institutional person contacting a student before they know they need the help. Um, we have an embedded service model. King would call it um, a shared service model. It's centrally coordinated through my office, through student affairs or student services, um, but each student success advisor is physically located in each academic area. Uh, we like to say that we have, uh, that our advising is enhanced through technology. So we have, um, uh, clockwork, which is for our session notes and for kind of your student relationship management software. DegreeWorks is a degree, degree audit software that helps students figure things out on their own online. Uh, the Succeed campaign and the Scholar campaign are, are things we do to do that intrusive proactive outreach uh, that Megan helps to coordinate. And then we also do some research. So um, this all is really trying to give you a sense of what the foundation is for this research and what we were building on um, when we proposed this research initially. The advising software Clockwork um, is really a, a quite affordable tool. It's used by many um, accessible learning departments uh, in Ontario. Uh, our counseling departments used it for a long time. So we purchased it and launched it with the advisors and all advisors on campus use this software. It guides our practice, ensures consistent data collection, um, if a student goes to see another advisor, they can look up session notes um, and what was talked about with that last advisor that they saw. Um, it's really excellent for being customizable. Uh, it has excellent security features so you can make sure that while a counselor can look at an advisor's notes, an advisor cannot look at a counselor's notes. And those kinds of things are really important. Um, and we can do a lot of reporting on it and so just basic volume is really important to understand that, you know, our, our eight or nine advisors had 6,700 contacts with students in the fall of 2014. Uh, and that's almost 3,000 unique students. So we have a good foundation of advising data and, um, and practice. And um, our advising outreach um, is focused on pre-entry, um, targeted sort of initiatives to ensure that students are ready. Um, and then we have some early intervention approaches. We have uh, a scholar campaign, which is really to reach out to them with some phone, call, um, phone calls and some emails to ensure that they have the resources they need. Um, and then we offer some mid, uh, midterm reading break programming to help students um, get back on track if they've fallen off track in the first uh, part of the semester. So this is the, foundation, whoops, clicking ahead too far. Um, and in 2012, almost from the time I got to the college, we had um, been in conversations with Ross Finney um, about contracting him to do a deep dive into our data and give us some descriptive statistics 
uh, descriptive analysis of retention. What does that look like for our students? Um, to slice it and dice it as, in as many ways as we can. So we put a lot of time and energy into creating a data sharing agreement, uh, a data transfer protocol that met all sorts of security and confidentiality um, agreements, went through legal on both campuses. Um, and so, and that's all just using basic administrative data that we had. And so over the course of a few years, he produced seven different reports for us that looked at retention of first generation students, retention of Aboriginal students that looked at things by program of study and age and all sorts of variables. Uh, he even did a presentation for our Board of Governors. Um, and through that work, he created a predictive model um, that used things like high school and college GPAs, um, responses to questions in our student entrance survey, which was originally created uh, by Peter Dietschy, um, who is uh, a, quite a prolific researcher in community colleges in Canada, um, our math and, and communication assessment scores, and some registration data. So that we already had in place. And so then what happens is HECO puts out a request for proposals in fall 2014 uh, for access and, uh, and retention consortium. Um, and we put in not one, but two proposals. And that's with the support of EPRI, and that's with the support of our Vice President, William Poirier. Um, and we said, you know, we're doing this stuff. This may be really practical for us to evaluate, and maybe HECO would pay us to do some of that work. And uh, to our um, delight, they said yes. And we actually had two projects that were um, supported through this consortium. Um, and that second project is about self-authorship and future authoring. Uh, and some stuff we did at our orientation that I'd be happy to talk about on another day. But, you know, I think HECO really was, was quite innovative in this approach. Um, and so there's details here on this page. You can look up uh, the Access and Retention Consortium and see the other institutions that are involved in the work that they're doing. Um, so we're really excited to be a part of that. It's been a very supportive process where all institutions help each other out with research. So, um, that's the foundation. That's what got us to this research project that we're talking about right now. So phase one, which is not the part we're going to focus on too much today, are what are the historical retention rates and characteristics of first semester students at Mohawk College in the following categories of student readiness and risk? So you'll see those there. And it looks like the slide is, uh, didn't show up exactly as intended, so my apologies for that. And the second question of phase one is, does our predictive model effectively identify students at risk of leaving college early? So really, let's have a look at uh, Ross Finney's model. Let them re retroactively um, do a predictive model on the fall 2013 and fall 2014 cohorts, and then look at what the actual retention patterns were and, and see how accurate it was. And then what are the patterns of advising use and student retention based on these three classifications of students. What does it tell us about who uses advising and where could it help? Um, so that's part of phase one, which we're in the process of analyzing the data now and writing up the, the first publication for this, which we hope will be out in the next uh, uh, couple months. So phase two, which is what Megan's going to talk about, is the implementation of this part. And these two phases were happening in parallel. So this was a focused initiative on the fall 2015 students. How do group and one-on-one -on -one academic advising interventions affect students' participation rates in advising and retention rates at the college? And are they, there are any different patterns in participation rates or retention um, based on those student readiness classifications? So that will give us a, a deeper sense of who comes to advising, how does it have an effect on them, um, and we go from there. So this was all happening um, this past summer. And so at that point, I will turn it over to Megan, and she can uh, talk a little bit more about these research questions uh, and, uh, and the approach that we took. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I'm excited to be able to share with you the process of how we oper operationalize this research um, in the summer. 
So to start, um, as Tim mentioned before, our advising team uses a intrusive approach, which is really about being intentional and purposeful with contacting and connecting with students. So for this project, all confirmed applicants, uh, so again, meeting new students who had accepted their offer uh, to Mohawk, received a new form of outreach this summer, which was intrusive in nature. So uh, as a college, we see roughly 6,000 new incoming first semester students um, every fall. So in the summer, we worked closely with staff in admissions and corporate reporting to receive up-to-date data on students who confirmed their offer of admission with the college. And when we took these students, uh, what we did was we randomly assigned them into three equal groups using an algorithm in Excel which, to my surprise, was rather easy actually to set up. Um, each of these groups of students was then offered a different approach to outreach and advising beginning in late July. Um, and again, I think that the graphic on the page moved a little bit when it got uploaded, so I do apologize for that. Uh, but if you look at the first chart, you can see that the differentiated outreach and advising interventions were given, again, to these three different groups of students. Um, group number one was our control group. So these students received um, one email that advertised the SSAs and the services available to them prior to their arrival on campus. Um, and it also encouraged them to meet with their SSA early on in their time at Mohawk. So as you can see, this was more of a passive outreach and was strictly informational. Uh, group number two received virtually the same email as group number one, but they were provided with the opportunity to actually participate in an introductory group advising session. Um, so these students received this email up to three times, as you can see. Um, and with that email, um, afterwards they were also uh, reached out to um, through an e and call campaign. So they were strongly encouraged to attend this session. Um, and group number three received virtually the exact same email as well. But instead of one-to-one -one advising, they were offered group advising. Um, and again, they were strongly uh, encouraged to participate in that. So um, if, they, if students hadn't made contact by the third e-blast that we had sent them, um, they were also given a phone call from a trained student leader in week number four and five of the project, which happened around mid-August, uh, to encourage them to participate. So looking at the very bottom chart, which talks about the wave, um, you can see that we offered this outreach in three different ways uh, to ensure that we reached as many applicants as possible. Um, due to the structure of the outreach, students who confirmed their offer, offer after August 4th were unfortunately not included in any of the randomized groups. Um, admissions estimates that the number of students who confirmed their offer after August 4th was actually only around maybe 400 students, so that's roughly only 5% of all confirmed applicants. So once students actually received the e-blast, they were able to book an appointment for either one-to-one -one or group advising through phone or email. Um, and both advising interventions took place over a six-week period in late July and um, all of August. These appointments ended on September 4th, uh, which was the week before classes started. So to help facilitate these appointments, we had our advising staff kind of divide and conquer, if you will. Um, for the group advising sessions, we had 10 full-time advisors who were pre-booked um, to offer between two and three group sessions a day, as you can see in the chart. Uh, these sessions were roughly around an hour in length, so typically they only took around 45 minutes, depending on the size of the group that was registered. So some sessions at the beginning did go unbooked. But attended sessions actually had anywhere from three to five students in July, and actually up to 12 students per session in August. For the one-to-one -one advising sessions, we had five part-time advisors uh, facilitate between three and six sessions per day. Now, an interesting ha thing happened after week number two. Uh, we noticed that we had a much larger volume of students who were expressing interest in actually attending these sessions. So we wanted to uh, ensure that we could provide as much support as possible. You'll notice in the chart that from week three to week six of the project, we actually increased the number of sessions that we offered. So for instance, we added a group advising session every Monday and Friday, I believe, which meant that up to 15 group advising sessions could be facilitated each week. And for one-to-one -one appointments, we reduced the time from one hour down to just half an hour, which meant that we moved um, from only offering 60 one-to-one -one sessions a week to offering up to 150 one-to-one -one appointments each week. 
Um, the advisors facilitating the one-to-one -one sessions did know that their appointments normally only lasted around 20 minutes on average, so they were incredibly supportive of decreasing the appointment length to better meet the student needs. So in terms of operations, which I don't think I'm able to actually zoom forward to. Oh, there we go. Um, so in terms of the operations, all of the advising work was centrally triaged and facilitated in our McCasis Resource Center. So this is a center for uh, CE, or continuing education students. And it's typically a little bit underutilized during the summer months. So it served as the primary space for not only booking our advising appointments, um, but also for triaging students and hosting the appointments themselves. Bookings were completed both on the phone and through email uh, by five frontline staff members in a rotation. So in terms of the informed consent process, um, which is you know, consenting students actually into the research so we can use their information, this was actually facilitated by a team of four student leaders that we had trained. Um, and it happened when students arrived for their appointment. So once students checked in with the front desk staff for their appointment, they were greeted by a student leader who sat privately at a table with them to review the informed consent document, um, to you know, clarify any questions that they had about the research. And then the student leader provided the participant with a resource package for their session. Um, it's really important to note that students were informed that if they did not want to consent to have their information used for the research study, they could still participate in their scheduled appointment. Uh, having a team of student leaders facilitate this process, I think, was critical to establishing a sense of trust and uh, a real sense of familiarity with both the participants and any supporters that they brought with them. We had students bring their family, we had students bring you know, their boyfriend or their best friend. Um, our student leaders were able to you know, chat with our participants while they were waiting for uh, their appointment. They could chat about their program, you know, their background, where they were from, what their experiences were. Um, and the student leaders were also on hand to facilitate campus tours um, if you know, family or students wanted one. So it added a nice personalized touch to the whole process and was also critical um, from the administrative side of things to ensure that frontline staff could remain dedicated to triaging the endless phone calls and emails that we had coming in each and every day. So after being consented in, um, when students were called in for their appointment, whether it was you know, one to one or group, they received consistent information and a similar approach. So this helped us as researchers um, you know, ensure consistency within the project, but it also set a consistent expectation for the staff who were facilitating the appointments. Um, Tim and I oriented all of the advisors to the advising agenda prior to when the project began. And the agenda is on the screen for you to review. You can see that it's really just focused upon having students identify uh, key goals or priorities for the session. You know, having them identify a few central questions they'd like to answer, or a few important resources they'd like to receive. Um, this helped ensure that all of the sessions were really student-focused and tailored to the needs of uh, confirmed applicants who would be starting their program in a few weeks. The discussion and the information was based uh, primarily upon two documents which students receive, which is uh, the second last point on your screen. Um, and this uh, resource package, well, these pieces of information were given to them in a resource package during the informed consent process. So I'm just going to quickly share with you uh, some samples of what these documents look like. So the first one here is our student guide, and this is a document uh, that's created by student services um, to all confirmed applicants uh, once they've accepted their offer. So every single confirmed applicant gets something similar to this at Mohawk. Uh, you can see here that it primarily just provides like key dates and important tasks that students need to be aware of. The second document, um, is really interesting. The second document was used to um, specifically guide conversation more so about skills, so less so about important information and more so about success strategies. The interesting thing about this document was that um, it was actually created specifically for the advising appointments. So Tim and I collaborated with advisors, uh, counselors, instructional designers, and you know, some other student success staff to define some top 10 tips for student success. 
Uh, and by looking at it, again, you can see that in comparison to the student guide, it's primarily more skills-based. Um, and again, these two documents were really what comprised the big chunk of the advising discussions, whether students were in a group or a one-to-one -one appointment. Um, so I know that was probably a lot, um, and I tried to, you know, summarize kind of everything that we did from an operational standpoint really quickly. Um, again, if anyone has any questions about the logistics, I do encourage you to, you know, add your questions into the chat box so we can address them at the end of the webinar. Um, at this point, we're going to move on to the lessons learned because I think that the reflections were just as equally as important as the actual operations of the second phase of our research project. So in terms of timelines, I think one of the key takeaways for both Tim and I was certainly the uh, centrality of time management. So speaking for myself as a first timer with the research project, uh, it was definitely much more elongated than I would have imagined. Uh, so if we even just take like the research ethics board for instance, you can see here we've got a small little timeline up on the screen, but focus your attention specifically on you know, April and early July. Um, our REB application was submitted on April 30th, but it actually wasn't approved until early July. And this was because of a, a few amendments that needed to be submitted, both actually on our end and from our partners um, at the University of Ottawa. So if you are going to be initiating, you know, research on your campus, we would definitely advise from our experience to start the process early and just really be mindful of key deadlines that your REB board and any research partners have. Uh, and I'm sure Tim can speak more to the actual uh, you know, research ethics board process later as well. So in terms of reflecting upon the kinds of outreach that happened, because I found this to be really interesting myself, um, you can see our final participation numbers at the top of this slide. So by the end of the summer, we had 293 participants for group advising sessions, and we had 372 participants for one-to-one -one advising sessions um, in a six-week period. So we were quite happy with those results. Um, the first phase of the outreach being the e-blast, um, it was made much easier for us because we had a staff member, Barb Russell, uh, who was able to facilitate these for us. So this was really helpful in centralizing the process and having very open communication on our team about the timelines that we were working with. Uh, in terms of the call campaign, this was the second phase of the outreach to students. Um, and again, this used to train student leaders which, like I mentioned with the informed consent process, allowed for a really nice peer-to-peer -peer element uh, that helped establish a sense of connection. Our student leaders averaged around, I think, 20 calls per hour and successfully connected with 650 students over the phone, which is really interesting and successful. Um, now, of particular interest is the take-up rates for the call campaign. Uh, though, if you look at the top chart, there is only a four-point difference in total participation between the one-to-one -one and the group advising sessions. Take-up rates for the call campaign were actually much higher for one-to-one -one advising. So if you can look down um, in the middle section of the slide, 52% uh, of students who were reached over the phone booked a one-to-one -one appointment but comparatively, only 22% of students reached over the phone booked an appointment for a group session. So I think for us this really shows that students seem to prefer the idea of individual sessions, uh, you know, really seeking that one-to-one -one advisement before they enter college. But as Tim will explain later, student feedback for both interventions was equally very positive. Uh, lastly, participation rates were highest with students who confirmed their offers earlier in the summer. So here we're comparing wave one with wave two and three. Um, this kind of, you know, a participation rate can be expected given that typically these students tend to present as being a little bit more committed to their studies. Now, moving on to talking about the operations, which I will admit was a uh, huge learning curve for me. Um, I personally loved really having the student leaders to help facilitate both the call campaign and the informed consent process. Um, not only is it operationally efficient, but it also adds a really nice personal touch, which I've spoken to before, and it allowed for some really meaningful interactions to take place. So for me, that was a really important bit, um, especially amongst all of the other stuff that we kind of had going on. Um, in terms of the actual you know, full-time and part-time staff, 
scheduling around 15 advisors to do advising during an already critical point in the year um, was, I'll be totally honest, a little bit difficult. Students really seemed to want to schedule appointments as close as possible to the first week of classes. Um, and this made it really difficult to book advisors who already had other pieces of their portfolio to attend to at this time. Um, for me, I think a takeaway was that confirming the availability of the advisors and providing a consistent weekly schedule made it a lot easier for the advisors to slot themselves into appointments. So for instance, all of the uh, SSAs knew that you know, we had sessions happening three times a day from Monday until Friday, and those times varied. So it was either a 10 o'clock appointment, a 12 o'clock appointment, a 2 o'clock, or a 4 o'clock. Um, so that consistency really you know, helped make the scheduling a little bit easier. Now, in terms of the triage process, that was a little bit more intensive administratively than anticipated as well, um, especially since we, we only used Excel to track and schedule students. So in future, I definitely think that capitalizing upon you know, an online booking system would be incredibly helpful uh, for that piece. And in terms of space, uh, using the cases really helped us centralize all of our efforts. And it was really critical to the success of the program at large to have you know, the triage, the informed consent process, and all of the appointments be delivered in one centralized space. Um, but I think all in all, Tim, I, Tim and I really just recognize that you know, the time and resources needed for this project was far greater than originally expected. Um, everything from administrative time to you know, printing and supplies costs, the training and supervision of nine student leaders, uh, and the orientation and scheduling of, what, 15 advisors and four frontline staff um, was all really heavy, I'll admit. But in the end, the team worked wonderfully together to pull off you know, an amazing summer initiative, uh, which Tim is going to discuss further now. Thanks, Megan. Um, so just about everything Megan talked about there are things that, uh, that she had uh, full control over uh, implementing. It was a really complex uh, implementation, far more than I think we would have ever anticipated. And every time we learned something new, we learned how complicated it was. Uh, and so Megan really did a wonderful job. So kudos to, to her. And, and the other part of this is, is as we put forward this research proposal, we, we built in the money for um, for her kind of role um, in the work that she's doing. And, and that was, was it's absolutely critical to, to this kind of project uh, and the partnership as a whole between EPRI and HECO and Mohawk um, was key. And you'll also note she talked about a whole bunch of staff. Thankfully, most of them uh, work within my department, so it was easy to create collaborations. But we also had lots and lots of support from, from marketing, from corporate reporting, um, and, and those folks that are outside of my department um, that were supportive of, of this research. So some other um, reflections. Uh, the student feedback, the response was, was really quite positive. I think we would probably build in a more formal evaluation, like qualitative evaluation of their experience afterwards uh, if we were to replicate the study in the future because it seemed like the, the, the the feedback was positive for both the group and the one-on-one, -on -one, even though the initial take-up rates are greater for the one-on-one -on -one advising. Um, and the, the advisors themselves, while they were totally nervous and scared for the additional work they needed to do in the summer, this is a very quiet time for their advising or the type of advising they typically do. But it's always been the intention that they were to do this kind of work. So the project served as a catalyst for that, um, and they loved it. Um, and because we divided it out among the whole team, we were piloting the use of, of a centralized location just for this research, um, because again, that space was a space that um, fell within my portfolio that I had some control over and so could pull the team in uh, to do some of that work. Um, that was critical to, to this process with the flexibility I had as a, as a director to, to do some of those things. Um, and you know, they, they learned so much. I would say Megan learned a ton. Our student leaders learned a lot. 
Um, and the connection that I think the advisors made with the students was, was positive and profound, and I hope the data uh, shows that as well, because the, the connections that the staff made for students in terms of like if a meeting ended pretty early, one of the things I said was, well, then take the student physically over and walk them over to the department you're making the referral to. So there was that sort of high touch opportunity there, which I think uh, makes a big difference. Um, moving forward, we are waiting really impatiently for data, um, uh, the re-registration data. Um, I was hoping to actually have some uh, before today. Um, but this will give us our first look at, you know, did this make any difference? Um, we'll be waiting until um, the fall to pull the semester one to three retention rates um, of these students that we intervened with in the summer. So the fall coming up would be their third semester, and we'll send all of that data to Ross Finney and the team at EPRI to analyze and, and start writing uh, that report uh, for winter 2017. Uh, right now, we'll stay focused on writing the report for phase one on pr predictive modeling, uh, and I'm working hard to make sure I have some money to do similar kinds of outreach next summer, despite the fact that the research isn't occurring, because I think just anecdotally, um, it, it's quite positive. So finding a way to, to do some online booking, to have some students available to help triage, and to, to bring advisors into a central location to support students before they arrive, I think is important. And then um, we're presenting the results of this study. I'm hoping to present bits and pieces of it again at caucus uh, this summer. Uh, and then um, we've put in uh, proposals to present at Nakata Region 5, which is, I think, in the first week of April. So for you advisors on the line that uh, are looking for some other PD opportunities, those would be two that I would uh, definitely uh, recommend. So that's about it for us. Um, we finished a little bit early, noticing it's about 11.42. So hopefully this has been a positive and efficient use of your time. We really went over just the implementation of what we're doing and some of our research questions and what it takes to put on a project like this. We're excited to have some results to share uh, over the next year or so, and we'll be publishing some of those things through HECO. Um, and so maybe we can open it up for, for questions. Um, I'm not sure how best to facilitate it, but if you have questions that you'd like to put through through the chat mechanism, that would be um, wonderful. And Megan and I can try and answer some of those questions. Um, certainly, if you have other questions that you'd like to uh, to ask, don't hesitate to co contact either of us directly. If you want to come visit and hang out at Mohawk, we'd love to have you here as well. So I'm just continuing to talk and fill some airspace to see if um, um, anybody has any questions and uh, see if I can try and answer them. So I see Heather Doyle. Uh, students were assigned to the group category but wanted individual advising. What did you do? So that's a great question. Uh, in general, uh, I think we just let them move over to one-on-one. -on -one. Megan, you can correct me. Uh, but we've made specific notations in our data for that. So when we get into the analysis, we know kind of what happened with that student, and we can make a decision whether to include or exclude them from the analysis. Megan, does that make sense? Yes, yeah, and that's absolutely right. We kept extremely pristine data. I'm very happy to say that uh, because it made, you know, the whole process after the project a lot easier to, you know, kind of reflect back on. Um, we did have students who came, and, you know, they, the one-to-one -one sessions and the group sessions were happening concurrently, so students would hear, like, oh, you know, this person's getting group advising. Uh, why am I doing one-to-one -one and they're doing group? So again, we would just reinforce this as part of a research project. Um, the information that is, you know, happening in both sessions is the exact same. It's the same agenda. It's just a different format. Um, and so we really train the student leaders to kind of talk students through that. And if the students did still indicate that they wanted, you know, uh, they wanted to be put in one-on-one -on -one advising, but they were placed into the group advising, we absolutely accommodated that and just made a note in our spreadsheet. Okay. 
Um, so I see uh, a few questions here, and I'll get to all of them. So Paul from, uh, from Ryerson um, has asked, um, what is the organization of academic advising at Mohawk? Is it mainly a centralized unit? Do faculty do some advising? So I would consider it kind of a, um, a two-tier approach. So the uh, academic advising um, that isn't really related to exemptions and a lot of the items that faculty members have the expertise for is done by the student success advisors. Uh, so the embedded model, every SSA uh, is in an academic area, and they work very, very closely with the faculty, with the associate deans in that area. We have faculty members that are known as program coordinators. They're kind of the, the lead full-time faculty member in every single program. They do a fair amount of advising as well. So, um, but that is, is less structured um, in the model. It really is more about talking about uh, the program of study, what do they need to, uh, to do to get a job and, and all of those things. So um, it's a two-pronged approach, if that answers your, your question, Paul, but I'd be happy to chat with you more about that at another time. I also see a uh, question that I missed earlier from Rhonda Christian asking about feedback from parents. Um, I don't recall anything challenging from parents um, in this process other than um, wondering why their son or daughter may be signing a consent form. So that was, that's always a tricky thing when uh, people get on guard and get a little bit defensive when you're talking about a research study. So it's, it's about ensuring that they're aware that a study is happening, they can participate in advising, and it's always anonymous and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but that we would be looking at their data otherwise. Megan, did you have any examples of any feedback from parents on this? I did, and I, I have to say parent feedback was incredibly positive. Um, and there were even some circumstances where, you know, students would come to the appointment and they would bring their parent or guardian with them, and they'd be, you know, a little bit hesitant, like maybe they didn't want to be here. They're like, oh, I don't want to have an appointment. Like, why do I have to do this? But they would come out of the appointment feeling, you know, very confident uh, with moving forward and starting their studies at Mohawk. And while they'd be in their appointment, the parents would have the opportunity to chat with all of the student leaders who were in the cases. Um, so at that point, they'd be able to ask student leaders, you know, how do you like your program? What does the college offer in terms of, you know, like student services? Um, you know, what, what does the community feel like? Uh, all of those kind of questions that parents have on their end were facilitated by the student leaders in the room, which I thought was also incredibly positive. So both parties, the student and their parent or their guardian, walked out, I think, feeling a lot more confident with what will be happening to them in the next few weeks. Um, I see a question from Dale um, about the, the data for the predictive modeling. Was it all student information system? data, um, or did it include uh, entry survey data also? We've, uh, the, the best models, as Ross Finney will tell you, is put everything possible into it. So we've tried to give them as much as possible, including um, some specific questions from our student entrance survey that might speak to things like uh, motivation or commitment um, to the college, motivation to, to be at college, commitment to the program, those kinds of things. Um, how much we include or exclude for the purposes of this study, we're still tweaking a little bit. Um, and so we'll get into that in our analysis in the paper that we're, um, and we're the one that we're writing, uh, Ross will more specifically, uh, but we're trying to use as much as possible. Um, I also see a question from Pam. Um, would we be willing to share this presentation with non-caucus members via email? I'm happy to um, share information uh, as much as I can uh, in terms of the slides. I think they're going to be made available to everybody here. I have no concern with sharing things. I, I'm not sure if caucus does, um, but this is just really the, the genesis of the project and all of the real results will be coming out later, but I'm happy to share. Heather Doyle, uh, have you tracked students' access to advising advisors post-summer? Uh, were they more likely to see advisors? That's something we're going to look at more as time goes on. So because we have data about uh, in Clockwork about 
who's com- who comes to advising and how often they come to advising. Uh, future analysis could be since they were connected within the summer, how many more times did they come? Is it possible that this um, increased the amount or the likelihood that they would come to an advisor more often? Those are good questions for us to ask in the future. Uh, Leanne, were CICE students included in this research? Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember. I Megan, can, do you recall? Yeah, I can speak to that if you want. So we did have some CICE students. Um, the, the program at the college isn't necessarily very large. So we only had a really small proportion of CICE students who were actually, um, you know, randomized into group number two or group number three. So they mostly did connect with us to actually, you know, book an appointment. But um, what ended up happening was for CE, CICE students, there was also a orientation that was pl- taking place at the end of the summer. Um, so we always clarified that for the parents and for the students themselves, just to make sure that they were, were aware that there was a distinction between our advising and the orientation session they would be attending at the end of August. Um, For the CICE students who attended, we know every single student's program area. So we do have it noted in our spreadsheet that they were CICE. And they had extremely positive experiences with our advisors, and our advisors loved speaking with them. It was an especially positive experience, again, for the guardians that these students brought with them as well. Um, They were able to get a really personalized, you know, touch to orienting themselves and their children to the campus. Um, so we did have a few students and they had you know, incredibly positive experiences, which we're pretty happy about. Um, other questions from the group? Thank you for all of your questions so far. These have been great questions. Um, Jennifer Love Green, very interested in the predictive model. Is it one that could be easily modified to other institutions? institutions? If so, would you have an anticipated timeline? So the predictive model is, is something that, uh, that Dr. Ross Finney and uh, EPRI have created. Um, I would consult with them directly uh, about the use of their model. I'm sure they would love to work with every institution. Um, it is customized uh, by institution and it is based on the um, the data and the attributes of the students at your institution. So I think it could be customized, but it's not necessarily something that is um, available out of the box, if you will. Um, I'd be happy to chat with you more about that uh, at another time, if you like. And Aaron, thank you for your kudos. We really appreciate it. Um, And thank you, everybody, for taking time out uh, of your day to speak with us uh, today and to listen in. And um, I see Rhonda putting in um, a, a final sort of plug for Nakata Region 5, April 6th to 8th. Register now. There is limited number. Um, and she said, be sure to sign up for Tim's pre-conference. Yes, I will be co-hosting a pre-conference with Caucus, uh, the Ontario Academic Advising Professionals, uh, and folks from Nakata. So um, there you go, Rhonda. Thank you for that plug. I put it in. Uh, I think we'll probably call it uh, a day here. 11.53, give you a few minutes to get to whatever you are up to um, at noon. Thank you for participating, and um, good luck with all of your advising. Thank you, Tim and Megan. Uh, this is Amy once again. Uh, I think everybody really learned a lot from you today. Um, I do also just want to throw in a final plug that today is the deadline for caucus proposals. So if you are interested in submitting a program proposal, you still have time. Um, So start scribbling away this afternoon. Uh, Thanks once again, Tim and Megan. Everybody have a great Friday afternoon and a wonderful weekend, and hopefully we will see you all at caucus in June. Take care, everyone.